So this is the message for April 26, 2020. It is the fourth Sunday of the Easter season. And uh, we are taping at Tower Grove Park in South St. Louis City. I mentioned it in a couple former messages. And I thought about coming to the park today because the gospel lesson is from Luke's gospel in the 24th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. It is the appearance of the resurrected Christ to two of his disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. And I thought, why not take a walk? I called today's message, A Walk in the Park. Uh, for obvious reasons uh, since I'm in this setting but also because uh, our walk with God can be compared to a journey a journey of faith and so as we walk in the park today I want for us to think about our walk with God and it just was a good excuse also to get out and walk in the park you know so many of us are spending this quarantine time getting out in our own neighborhoods and it's good for us it's good for us to take those walks and it's good for us also to walk with God you don't have to go anywhere to take a walk with God uh, even though we're going to go somewhere. I wonder if you saw the story in the news last week about a British World War II veteran named Tom Moore at the age of 99. His 100th birthday is the last day of this month of April, and he set a goal to walk 100 laps around the garden in his backyard on his walker after his hip surgery to raise money for the health care workers in Britain. He reached his goal prior to his birthday just last Thursday, and he was going to raise $1,000, but his walk caught so much attention he raised 16 million dollars <laughs> he said mr moore said i have won a lot of battles in my life and i'm going to win this one too i think that's a fabulous attitude so come we're going to walk into the park here we're going to discover one thing about tower Grove park and i want to tell you a little bit about it. the park while we're talking about the bible today also henry shaw donated this land to the city of st louis also his country estate which became Shaw's Garden, now known as Missouri Botanical Garden, nearby, you can see from here. And Shaw had a love for botany and horticulture. Here in this park, he decided to make it an arboretum. In fact, it is the largest arboretum in the nation. There are 7,000 trees here, 400 different species. Let's walk and take a look at some of them. One of the most unique things about this park is the gazebos and the, and the shelters that are here. They're not just provisional, but they're, they're kind of, they got a lot of bling on them. <laughs> This one, in fact, that's behind us is the Turkish Pavilion. It's the biggest one in the park, and I think it's the coolest one. This would look neat on the grounds at St. Martin's Church, wouldn't it? I think we could pull that off if we get together and put a cupola on the top and some red and white stripes. There are 32 such pavilions in this park, and I intend for us to look at some of them and also to take a little bit of a tour of the statuary and the other unique things about the park while we're taking our walk in the park today. Henry Shaw thought that statuary should be a part of his park, in addition to the fabulous gazebos and the thousands of trees that we've already observed here. Nearby, uh, in another part of the park that we're not going to walk to today, is a statue of Baron Friedrich von Steuben. He was a German immigrant who volunteered with George Washington's Revolutionary Army. He's honored here, I'm sure, because of the German heritage of this part of town. In fact, I think Shaw thought that the Germans in this part of town might have appreciated, especially this kind of a park. There's a German tradition. There's even a word for it. I'm going to try to say it. Sontag Spatzirgen. I'm talking in tongues. Sontag Spatzirgen. And it means that after breakfast and after church, the German people would take a long Sunday walk in the park and they would eat delicious cakes afterwards. I like the cakes part. <laughs> There's a statue behind me here too to another immigrant, or it represents immigration. The Italian people in town honor this uh, statue of Columbus on Columbus Day because of their Italian heritage. There's been some controversy around it because the settlers were unkind to the indigenous people, but the park has formed a committee, sort of like we do in churches, to study that, and they want the park to be a welcoming place for all people. This particular statue has been surrounded in controversy from the beginning, by the way. When you look closely at it, we'll try to get a picture of it uh, uh, today before we quit taping. It has a beard on it, and Shaw wanted for Columbus to have a beard in his statue. The sculptor didn't want it to have a beard, uh, and Shaw won because he was paying for it. So this is the only sculpture of Columbus in America with a beard on it. I think that this statue in particular has something to do with our walk with God because it reminds us as we walk with God that we are in between people. People of faith are always living in between the place where we are and the place of promise. After all, those disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus found that they were entertaining Jesus himself as they welcomed that stranger that they talked to, who they came to know in the breaking of the bread. This is our call then as God's people to remember that we are strangers in a strange land. We don't belong in any culture because the culture that we live in is temporary. Only heaven is eternal and that's our real home. The statue behind me in Tower Grove Park was commissioned by
by Shaw on behalf of a contemporary of his in the 1800s, Alexander von Humboldt. I dare say he's not a household name, especially for someone to have a statue in the middle of a big park in the middle of the city. In fact, there are two pavilions dedicated in his honor also on either side of the statue here in the middle of the park. Humboldt was in the 1800s a horticulturist. He was a botanist. He traveled the globe finding any plants that he could find that he could bring back here with him to the States. And so Shaw appreciated him for his love of botany. I think he has to do with our walk with God today because while we're taping today, this day in the middle of April on a Wednesday, the 22nd is Earth Day. This is Earth Day today. It's the day when we celebrate our commitment to God's creation because we walk with God, because we're people of faith. We understand that living on this globe, sharing this planet with one another is a trust from God. You know, we have a friend in our church, Richard Koenig, who lives out in Lowndale. Tell him I said his name so he'll watch the video later on. Rich has been planting trees on his property along with his wife, Paula, for years. And last time I visited with him, FedEx was bringing him dozens of seedlings. He's been planting pines and walnut trees and maples and oaks just because he loves God's green earth. This is our call to be God's people who walk with God, who take care of this planet together. Shaw also decided to honor his commitment to culture and to the arts with the statuary that he placed here in this park. Behind me is the first statue that Shaw commissioned, the statue of the bard Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare had a tremendous influence on every culture in the world. You say things that he wrote every day and don't even think about him when you say it, like a wild goose chase or like you're speaking Greek to me. They're all from Shakespearean plays. Also, not far from here, I can see it from my perspective, and maybe we'll get a glance of it for you as we go by. There is a bandstand in the park, and around it, Shaw placed the busts of some of his favorite composers. There is Beethoven, and there is Wagner, and there is Verdi. He wanted for people who came here to have an appreciation for the arts. I think it applies to our walk with God this way. We need to be giving God praise. It's a commandment. And it's a difficult thing to do in these times when we're finding it difficult to make ends meet or to make our wits meet our, our mindset. But it's something that we must do. If we wait until times are perfect to be thankful and grateful to God, we never will be. And so we must, we must search for things to be grateful for. It's not contrived. It's not naive. In fact, it is God's way. And so I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the rather obscure Old Testament book of the prophet Habakkuk. In the third chapter, Habakkuk says, Though the fig tree doesn't bloom and though the crops all fail, yet will I praise God. What does it take to be able to praise God that way, to rejoice in God that way? It doesn't mean losing your mind. In fact, it means finding your spirit. Spirit is the gift that God gives us to rise above on every occasion. And so our walk with God needs to include praise. And that will make us grateful people that will be able to endure every time, even this current time. I wanted to conclude today's message here by the reflecting pond and the fountain in the center of this park uh, for a couple reasons. One, there's a beautiful reflecting pond here. It's the prettiest place in the park. It's the most well uh, landscaped in the park. You'll see in just a moment, but we want to show you some of those pictures. But the reason that I wanted to end it here is because the, uh, the, the stones around the reflecting pond here are actually reclaimed stones. They are stones from the old Lindo Hotel here in St. Louis City. <laughs> They are reclaimed from a time of ruins and destruction. In fact, it's called the ruins. And I wanted to end here because I wanted to make one more point about this road to Emmaus. You know, the disciples walked with Jesus all along, not recognizing that it was him until they broke the bread. And that brokenness surely is supposed to indicate Holy Communion to us, but also it's supposed to remind us that our walk with God is going to include brokenness. In fact, it doesn't include it as a matter of happenstance. It includes it by design. Christ came to Calvary and to be resurrected to show us that the way that God has designed our redemption is not to remove suffering from us, but to share it with us and to redeem it by going through it with us. And so it turns out that our walk with God is not a walk in the park in terms of the fact that it's not easy. It's going to include suffering. It's going to include despair. But Christ will share that despair with us. And I think that's the best message for this day and this time right now for all of us. This part of this week's message is actually kind of a gift to everyone who will watch this video and share it with a friend. I wanted to give you a guided devotion for a walk of your own. Once again, it can be a walk in your own backyard if you want to, or even in your living room if you want to do it by spirit or in a virtual way. But if you're taking an actual walk, this is what this is designed to do. It's designed to give you some thoughts for meditating on, or you're taking your own beautiful walk somewhere. Uh, Full disclosure, it's from a Franciscan website, and I think it's a wonderful devotion. It begins by by talking about the things that we can see as it 
talks about all of our senses on this walk that we might make. During the first three minutes of your walk, you might even want to set a timer. Concentrate on everything that you see with your eyes. Let go of any other thoughts or sensations that pop into your head. Notice the sky and its shades of blue. Notice the trees, how many colors of green are there? Do you see any buds or flowers? How about insects or flies or beetles or even mosquitoes? Look in all directions, look up close out to the horizon and between the trees, search out small details, the veins of a leaf, the wings on a dragonfly, survey the broad picture, the hills in the distance, the clouds and the skyline. Keep walking and looking until your timer goes off at three minutes or until you feel the Holy Spirit nudging you into the next phase. Remind yourself that God has given you all these treasures as signs of his love. Imagine the joy he feels in showing them to you. And finish this visual meditation by reciting or else just listening to this recording of Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 10. When I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mere mortals that you call them your own? Yet you have made them little less than God, crowned them with glory and honor, You've given them rule over the works of your hands, put all things at their feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever swims the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how awesome is your name through all the earth. During the next three minutes, concentrate on everything that you hear. Stop looking intently and listen instead. Once again, let go of any other thoughts or sensations that pop into your head. Listen for traffic, can you hear cars on a city street? A lawnmower? How about air traffic such as a plane? Are there birds? How many different bird calls can you hear? Are there people nearby? Children playing and laughing or people chatting with each other? Are there animals? A dog barking or a horse? As before, walk and listen until your timer goes off at three minutes or else until you feel the spirit nudging you into the next phase. Remind yourself that despite all this noise, God hears you whenever you call out to him and finish your listening meditation by reciting this Psalm or else listening to this recording, Psalm 86 verses one through seven. Hear me, Lord, answer me for I am poor and oppressed. Preserve my life for I am loyal save your servant who trusts in you you are my god pity me lord to you i call all the day gladden the soul of your servant to you lord i lift up my soul lord you are kind and forgiving most loving to all who call on you lord hear my prayer listen to my cry for help in this time of trouble i call for you and you will answer me in the next three minutes concentrate on everything you feel not on the inside but on the outside remember to let go of any other thoughts that pop into your head and walk until your timer goes off or until you feel the Holy Spirit nudging you to the next phase. Can you feel a gentle breeze on your face or a strong wind? Is sunshine warming your face or rain tickling your skin? Is the surface upon which you are walking hard like pavement or soft like grass? Look down and study whatever is at your feet, a pebble, a stick, a leaf. Gently pick it up and hold it in your hand. Roll it between your fingers, sensing its texture, shape, and detail. Try to feel your feet connect with the ground beneath you. Notice as your heels touch first and then concentrate on the rest of your foot as it connects to the ground. Concentrate on each step and on the subtle differences in the terrain. Even when it's irregular, notice how the ground is solid and reliable. Remind yourself that God is sturdy and reliable and will not let you down. Finish your meditation with the words of Psalm 91, verses 1 through 12. Read it or else listen to this recording. You who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, say to the Lord, my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I trust, God will rescue you from the fowler's snare, from the destroying plague, will shelter you with pinions, spread wings that you may take refuge. God's faithfulness is a protecting shield you shall not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that roams in darkness, nor the plague that ravages at noon. Though a thousand fall at your side, and a thousand at your right hand, near you it shall not come. You need simply watch the punishment of the wicked you will see. 
you have the Lord for your refuge. You have made God the most high your stronghold. No evil shall befall you. No affliction shall come near your tent. For God commands the angels to guard you in all your ways. With their hands they shall support you, lest you strike your foot against the stone. For this final section of our meditation, we're going to focus on the senses of tasting and smelling God's gifts. These two senses are intric intricately connected, so we will focus on them together. Open your mouth slightly. Touch your tongue to the back of your teeth. For the next three minutes, breathe through your mouth and nose, allowing each fragrance to evoke a taste. Are there city small smells? Are there city smells such as exhaust or tar? What does tar taste like? Is it pungent or bitter? Are there smells of other people around you? Is there odor from a pizza or perfume like vanilla? Are there country smells or, or mulch smells like manure? Does hay smell sweet? What about fresh cut grass or flowering buds? Do they smell like onion or mint? Remind yourself that no earthly food or pleasure can fill your heart's deep longing for God. Finish the taste and smell meditation by reciting or listening to this verse from Psalm 42, verses two through six. As the deer longs for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O God, by being thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and see the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night as they ask daily, where is your God? Those times I recall as I pour out my soul, when I went in procession with the crowd, I went with them to the house of God amid loud cries of thanksgiving with the multitude keeping festival. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why do you groan within me? Wait for God, whom I shall praise again, my Savior and my God. In closing, stand in place for a few minutes or even for only a few seconds. Thank God for this time that you shared and the gifts that he revealed. Resolve to carry this mindset of gratitude and awareness with you through the rest of your day. Whether you take a walk in the park or a spiritual walk from the safety of your home in a quarantine sanctuary, with God's help and your imagination, walking with God and praying can be a regular part of your day. Amen.